So let's talk about some types of x-rays that people are familiar with and give a sense of radiation dose. And I'm also curious as to how much this depends on the size of the individual. In other words, does a it person does. that is larger receive more radiation for this same test, sure. like a chest x-ray? Sure. Uh, and they certainly do because you have to use more energy to get into a larger person. Having said that, there's two different things here. Because in what we normally deal with when I'm talking about dose to a tumor is the dose actually at that spot uh, versus a whole body dose, which is a very different uh, metric. And so for someone who I'm treating with, say, eight weeks of radiation for prostate cancer, their prostate may get 80 gray in 1.8 to 2 gray fractions per day. But that's literally only to a small volume, roughly the size of the prostate gland itself. And when you even get just a few millimeters away from that, that dose gets cut in half. And then it's exponentially lower because the intensity of the radiation varies with the square of the distance. So as you get even you know, a couple of feet away, that goes down significantly. But typically a patient who is getting, you know, 80 gray, is a, if 80 gray was a whole body dose, that would obviously be lethal. Yep. Uh, but... Um, the, the whole body dose is is more like a few milligray in that sort of situation. So we typically don't see like full body sequelae or anything from doing even the heavy duty diagnostic treatment. Now for the CT scan, we almost consider that negligible in our area because again, I'm dealing with you know, mega voltage, high dose cancer killing radiation. And so when they get a CT scan, which is going to be just a few millisieverts or milligray, um, that's almost considered rounding error versus what they're getting to the uh, to the tumor but let's area. take something like a chest x-ray. Sure. So chest x-ray, again, I, people should anchor to this idea for what it's worth, mm -hmm. and we can come back to this. NRC says, hey, limit your annual radiation right. to 50 millisieverts. Mm -hmm. uh, you got 2% of that just being alive because you Correct. happen to go outside and be exposed to the sun. Right. So the other, you know, 98% uh, might come through flying, mm -hmm. Diagnostic. Let's say you fly a lot. That might yeah. get you up another 10%. Right. Um, so let's talk about a chest x-ray. Mm -hmm. You got a cough. You go to your doctor. They do a chest x-ray. That's how many millisieverts for a normal sized person? Normal sized person, it's it's a fraction. It's probably less than one millisievert actually. So it's yep. it's significantly, it's 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 something that where, um, you know, people who are concerned about things like diagnostic mammograms and all every year, you're still talking about maybe one millisievert or even a little bit less than that with some of the newer machines. And so uh, you're in a zone where it is, you know, there, we, there's a principle we talk about, it's called ALARA, A-L-A-R-A, -A -A, which is as low as reasonably achievable. And that's been the sort of the uh, mantra for our radiation safety people, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and whatnot, that you want to keep things as low as, as possible. But having said that, when you get, when you're talking about numbers of less than 50 millisieverts, uh, that's kind of an arbitrary number. So it's not like getting, you know, people who've got, uh, I, I should have maybe gotten a chest x-ray when I had my cough last time, but I just, I just don't want to do it. I don't want the exposure, but it's so minimal in terms of biologic effect that we really don't even really worry about those, even if it's getting one of them a month or so. And a big reason for that is a lot of these numbers, especially the 50 millisievert number, is extrapolated from higher exposure rates. And so it's a there's something called a linear no threshold model or LNT, and that's been written about extensively. And that's what we're all taught in radiobiology and residency. One fourth of my radiation training in, in, in residency was actually radiation biology biology in addition to clinical oncology and radiation physics. But so the linear no threshold model is what states that even, you know, we, we know based on all the, the data from, uh, you know, from a nuclear uh, uh, fallout from Chernobyl, from Three Mile Island, of course, from Hiroshima, Nagasaki, from the bombs, that um, at a certain dose exposure, there's a certain risk of developing a cancer or any other endpoint, whether it be dermatitis or bone marrow suppression. There's all, all these numbers are well sorted. But when you try to extrapolate lower, so you take maybe say a dose of, say, one full sievert, you know, with a thousand millisievert, and you start extrapolating that lower and lower to where you're looking at like 100 or 50 millisieverts, the linear model assumes that there's some level of damage even at those lower levels. But in reality, there's actually a threshold. There is, it's the, the, the LNT, which is linear no threshold, has actually been proven to be uh, actually uh, erroneous. And so at very low doses, it's actually been shown that there's almost no incidence of any sort of uh, biological damage. And there's also, it's controversial 
controversial, but there's animal studies showing there may be a hormesis effect at low, low doses like that. So when we get tell, down tell below- Tell people what that means, because that's, sure. that's obviously going to come back later in our yeah, discussion. So, you know, regular listeners of your podcast know all about hormesis, and you talk about in, in, in the exercise realm and uh, cold plunges and saunas and whatnot. But the whole idea is doing some degree, a small amount of cellular damage. Uh, when the body repairs that, it actually comes back stronger than it was without the exposure in the first place. And in animal studies, they've actually shown at very low doses, we're talking about single digit millisieverts here, that uh, they've seen in mouse bones, for example, increased osteoclast activity, or excuse me, decreased osteoclast and increased osteoblastic activity. So the bones actually heal quicker. And uh, some of the soft tissue as well has been has been shown to actually recuperate in much in the way you see in the uh, uh, hormesis from other causes. And that's not something that we're, I'm claiming is uh, you know widely accepted, but there is a lot of data showing that that is a, certainly a possibility, which goes against this classic LNT model. And the LNT model itself, the guy that won the Nobel Prize for it in the 1940s did this all on fruit flies, and his work was disproven over the years after that. And so a lot of this low-dose radiation safety stuff we have is certainly a, a, a noble goal to keep the dose as low as possible. But when we get down into these millisievert ranges, I think that they're probably a little bit overblown in terms of the actual uh, negative effects on the human body. When I think about where, for example, something like a CT angiogram mm -hmm. used to be, right? So uh, right. That, that would easily have uh, exposed a person to 25 millisieverts mm -hmm. to do a CT scan of the heart. For sure. Um, you're doing it, you know, slowing the heart down, getting the contrast in there, et cetera. Uh, today, the really fast scanners, the, the best of the best scanners are somewhere between one and three millisieverts for that same procedure. True. I certainly favor having patients get its, you know, getting a scan with that. Acknowledging though that I don't have amazing data to point to, to say that the 25 millisievert one versus just to make the math easy, the 2.5 millisievert one, right. tenfold difference. Uh, poses any difference in risk? Exactly. Um, what? Yeah. What? How? How do you think about that? Would Would you say what would be your confidence in saying that two point five is not actually better than twenty five from a cancer risk standpoint? So again, going back to that Alara principle, there's not a whole lot of data at these levels. I certainly would strive to keep it as low as possible, which is what that mantra says. But uh, I would go with the machine that has the best resolution. And if 25 is, if the radiologist tells me that the, that, that image is significantly better than a 2.5 uh, millisievert exposure, and, and some of the older machines are just less efficient. You may get a better image with the with the lower dose. I think the dose is pretty negligible. It really would. Got it. I so in other words, you're saying, I don't really care if it's 25 it's or 2.5. Quality. Quality. And the good news is yeah. these brand new scanners are faster, which is they why are. they're giving you less radiation. Exactly. Um, exactly. They have better, you know, and they have, they seem to have better resolution. And the same thing applies. That's on the diagnostic side. On the therapeutic side where I am, our machines are called linear accelerators. And there's a similar uh, progression as, you know, we, as we've been able to focus the beams more and more precisely, that actually caught, it's a modulation of the beam. And you have a lot of photons being showered in the general vicinity of a patient, but you're blocking out everything except for a small area to treat. And the same way the newer machines do definitely have a lower uh, exposure to the, to, you know, just the room in general. So what should people be thinking about in terms of extraneous radiation? When should people be saying to their doctors, hey, do I really need this? You know, for example, when you go to the dentist every year, right. they typically want to do a set of x-rays. Mm -hmm. Is that anything people should be worried about? Not at all. Not in the least. I would certainly not skimp on, on uh, dental x-rays, mammograms, uh, if it's someone that needs cardiac workups and things like that. The potential, the risk-benefit ratio is so heavily in favor of doing these studies that I don't even think twice about them. And, when, and I think part of this comes from, you know, I've been doing this 25 years now. I have so many patients who've been through, when the, by the time they come to me as a cancer patient, They've been through so many CT scans, and nowadays we do PET scans. We follow up with annual PET scans after the fact, which are not only the CT, but you've got a radioactive isotope that's being injected into them. And we just really don't see now. There are certain situations where you are giving a, like for example, a, an intravenous therapeutic dose of radiation, say for thyroid cancer or things like that. There's certain uh, new uh, theranostics that are out there. In those situations, you have to be concerned because they can get into the multiple, you know, again, to a sievert range. But when you're in these millisievert ranges, 
it's such it's so important to do these studies. The benefits of mammograms are so proven. Dental X-rays, I I don't really think twice about them. Okay. Um, by the way, just on the PET scan, the rate what is so if you do a PET CT, for example, which again these are not routinely done. These right. are typically done in oncology patients only. Um, but just for my own understanding, are we talking sure. fifty to a hundred millisieverts if you're doing a, a whole body PET CT? I think it can be in that range. Yes, I okay. think that's exactly right. And uh, so PET CTs are relatively new, but uh, up until maybe a decade ago, the PET scan was independent of the CT. They would do them separately. But the data is so much better when you have the anatomical CT data overlay with the PET that whatever that extra dosage is, I think it's well worth it in terms of the resolution of what we're able to see and what we're able to mm -hmm. gain from that information. Thank you.